The almost six-year-long Battle of the Atlantic during World War II required the cooperation of every asset each nation had in its arsenal. In the era of the much-feared Kriegsmarine U-boats, the Allies significantly struggled while facing the enemy across naval blockades on the way to the Soviet Union and Allied territories in the Mediterranean. However, the Germans were surprised early in the battle by a peculiar aircraft that constantly tore down their powerful submarines, the short Sunderland flying boat. The potent, versatile, four-engined aircraft had a gun installation that led the Germans to dub it the Flying Porcupine. No one could have imagined that the aircraft that played a pivotal role in one of the most critical battles of the war was none other than a flying boat based on a civilian design that only turned military by accident. A Flying Boat for the Royal Air Force as United Kingdom officials realized their Air Force had no existing equivalent to the new American Sikorsky S-42 flying boat, or the German Dornier DOXS-23 in the early 1930s. They envisioned an aircraft with a similar performance to the brand new short Seraphand, albeit at a smaller scale. Then, in November of 1933, the British Air released specification R.233, calling for the development of a next-generation long-range flying boat intended to serve in a reconnaissance role over the oceans. The competition's result was another Short Brothers creation, the S-25 Short Sunderland. Named after a port city in northern England, the Sunderland was developed in tandem with the civilian S-23 Empire flying boat, and was specifically designed to conform to the British Air Ministry's requirements. While the aircraft shared several similarities with the Empire, it featured a more advanced aerodynamic hull for improved pilot vision, as well as an extensive array of offensive and defensive armaments, including aerial mines, bombs, depth charges, and machine gun turrets. The Short Sunderland was also fitted with detection equipment for combat operations, including radar units and searchlights. Sunderland. As a flying boat, the Short Sunderland had special beaching wheels that were often moored to a buoy. Supplies, fuel, and ammunition were brought by ships, and the model required careful maintenance to avoid damaging the hull. The fuselage's interior was divided into two individual decks, with the lower one containing six bunks, a pressure stove, a machine shop for in-flight repairs, and other living facilities. The aircraft was initially intended to have a crew of seven, but could sometimes carry more than eleven, depending on the mission. And while easy to fly, the pilot had the option to use autopilot for longer flights. Also, it was designed to reach a top speed of 210 miles per hour and to have an extensive range of 2,980 miles. The model was approved on October 16, 1937, after a successful maiden flight, and the first 90 machines were built not long after. The first Royal Air Force Squadron to receive their Sunderlands was equipped on June 22, 1938, with further deliveries over the next six months. By the time World War II broke out in September of 1939, the Royal Air Force had four Sunderland squadrons ready to take up the fight against Nazi Germany. Looking for enemies. The RAF Coastal Command had 40 Sunderlands in its arsenal by September of 1939. During the earlier years of World War II, the Sunderland's primary use was for tracking enemy shipping, flying long patrols over the empty seas while the crews spent their days living inside. In fact, some of the Sunderland's crews never saw a single enemy in the entire war. But although British anti-submarine efforts were quite disorganized and ineffective at first, the newly introduced Sunderland flying boat eventually proved helpful in rescuing crews from ships that had been torpedoed. As such, two Sunderlands rescued the entire 34-man crew of the Kensington Court merchant ship from the North Sea on September 21st, 1939. The Flying Porcupine As time went on, and the British sharpened their combat skills, the Sunderland was subjected to several improvements, including an upgraded nose turret with two 7.7mm guns instead of one, tail and dorsal turrets, gun hatches within the aft fuselage, and even additional guns placed by the crews. While they lacked range and hitting power, the Sunderlands had a fair number of weapons and was a well-built machine that proved hard to destroy. On April 3, 1940, a Sunderland operating off Norway was attacked by a formation of six German Junkers Ju-88 fighters. 
the Sunderland pilot managed to shoot one down and damage another, forcing it to land and drive off the rest. After the incident, the Germans nicknamed the type Fliegende Stachelsweine, or the Flying Porcupine. In response to all the Sunderland attacks, the Germans fitted some of their U-boats with up to two 37mm and twin quad flak guns to fire back at their attackers. U-Boat Destroyer The first unassisted attack carried out by a Sunderland against a German U-boat occurred on July 17, 1940. Moreover, it's estimated that the type might have sunk as many as 26 German U-boats. As the Allies looked for U-boats, the Sunderlands carried eight depth charges and would patrol the approaches or fly convoy protection missions. Both missions were often combined, and the Sunderlands met the convoys deep in the ocean. Upon sighting a U-boat, the Sunderland crews would try to engage it before it submerged back into the water, detonating depth charges that were set to explode at a depth up to 30 feet. Still, the Sunderland began to show its claws as British anti-submarine measures improved with more experience on the battlefield. Nevertheless, the type played a vital role in the Allied effort during the global conflict by countering the threat posed by the German U-boats during the Battle of the Atlantic, the longest continuous military campaign of the war. It also became one of the most powerful and widely used flying boats of World War II, and in addition to the Royal Air Force, the type was also used by other allies, such as New Zealand, Australia, Canada, South Africa, France, Norway, and Portugal. Modern Upgrades As more modern weapons were fitted into the flying boat, the aircraft became more effective in combat. However, they were also the reason behind one accidental friendly attack. In 1939, a hundred-pound anti-submarine bomb was dropped from a Sunderland, hitting the British submarine Snapper. While the fraternal bomb caused slight damage, other bombs reportedly bounced up and hit their launch aircraft. In response, the ineffective weapons were replaced by torpex-filled depth charges that would sink to a determined depth and explode afterward, thus eliminating the bounce-back effect and the subsequent shockwave that propagated through the water. The Sunderland flying boats also proved themselves in the Mediterranean theater, where one of them performed a reconnaissance mission to observe the approaching Italian fleet at anchor in Taranto, right before the famous Royal Navy Fleet Air Arm Strike torpedo attack on November 11, 1940. The aircraft also performed many successful evacuations during the German invasion of Crete in the spring of 1941. And that same year, the flying boat was fitted with a Mark II anti-surface vessel radar. A hint of vulnerability. As it flew low over the waves to prevent attacks from below, Sunderland was not an easy target, and its crews were able to defend themselves with impressive ease. Nevertheless, the type's most significant weakness, in addition to its slow speed, was its range, which was not enough to close the Mid-Atlantic Gap. As such, the Sunderland sometimes operated outside the scope of Allied fighters that could protect them, and was thus vulnerable to enemy fighter attacks. Late in the war, when the U-boats were armed with flak and had nothing to lose, the German craft would zigzag on the surface. In response, the flying boats were fitted with four fixed forward-firing guns. While the Sunderland could suppress flak with its nose turret guns to an extent, the U-boats' guns had an undeniably superior range, hitting power, and accuracy. Still, the confrontations between the German U-boats and the Sunderland flying boats became extremely dangerous for both parties often with fatal results. Retirement The Sunderlands from the RAF Coastal Command continued to perform submarine patrols until June 3, 1945, weeks after the war in the European theater ended. The use of the Sunderlands saw a steep decline in the post-war era. In fact, many of the models built at Belfast were taken out to sea and simply scuttled, as they were deemed useless. During the 1948 and 1949 airlift, in which the Soviet Union blocked the Western Allies' sea and land access sectors to Berlin under Western control, ten Sunderlands were used to transport supplies to the isolated city by landing on the Havel River and flying over 2,000 sorties. Then, beginning in 1950, several Sunderlands served during the Korean War. The 88th, 305th, and 209th squadrons shared the operations equally, with a rotation of three or four aircraft, with crews based at Iwakuni in southwest Japan. The missions lasted up to 13 hours, 
and were flown daily during the conflict and in the post-war armistice period that lasted until late 1954. The RAF continued to use the Sunderland in a military capacity until 1959. The following year, the French Navy, which had acquired their models in 1943, retired the last remaining examples in military use within the Northern Hemisphere. However, there was still a need for it in the Far East, where largely developed runways were less prevalent. As such, the short Sunderland served with the Royal Air Force Far East Air Force in Singapore until 1959, and with the Royal New Zealand Air Force's No. 5 Squadron until 1967. Ultimately, a total of 749 short Sunderland models were built during its 10-year production run, leaving a strong mark on the outcome of the war and the battle against the dreaded German U-boats. Thank you for watching Dark Skies. Before you go, please hit the like button, and don't hesitate to subscribe to this and all the Dark Documentaries channels for more exciting historical content. Stay tuned.